<laughs> Hello guys and welcome back to my what the f is that wave? <laughs> Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA as you might have sometimes seen it written. Um, I will show you my family tree DNA results and just kind of chat about the mtDNA section and what it all means, what you can do with it. Um, before I get started though, if you haven't already, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell because it really helps out my channel when you do. And that's it. Let's get started. So first up, I'm just going to say that I've decided to break this video into, I think, three videos because I've just had a look at some of the footage and it's way too long. So this first video, I will talk about the matches section. Um, in the next part, I will talk about the mutations section. And in the third video, I think I'll talk about ancestral origins and hopefully just everything else. So first I'll just mention that there are three kinds of DNA tests you can do. You're probably aware of this. There's the Y DNA test, which tests the Y um, chromosome. Only males can take this test. Only males carry a Y chromosome. Then you can do the MT DNA test. This tests your mitochondrial DNA. This is not the same as the X chromosome, so don't get it mixed up with thinking it is an X sort of test. Mitochondrial DNA is separate to all of those. Everybody carries mitochondrial DNA, so men and women can both take this test, um, but only females pass it on. So it is a direct female line, mother to mother to, or well, mother to child, to child to child, let's say that. So it, it's going to show you a direct female line, just like the Y um, test will show you a direct male line. And, oh, battery. And the last kind is the autosomal DNA test, which is basically everything else. So um, aside from your sex chromosomes and aside from the mitochondrial test, the autosomal test is just your general kind of um, DNA in your chromosomes. So back to mitochondrial DNA, you only really need to test one person in a family. So, you know, there would be no point in both me and my mother or my sister or anything like that all taking this test. So if I want to test my female line, I could test me or I could test my mother or her mother if she was alive or things like that. Um, if my dad takes the test, that will show his mother's line. So... Basically, just you don't need to all take the test because mtDNA is very stable and it's not really going to change between um, different family members. So mine and my mother's is going to be basically identical. So what does mtDNA give us? It tells us, um, like I said, our direct female line. It can tell us something about our sort of more distant geographic ancestry. Um, you can also compare it to family trees and you might make new connections and help expand your family tree if you're lucky there too. All right, so for now, let's head on over and I will show you the matches section of um, my family tree DNA results. Okay, so back on familytreedna.com and you scroll down past the autosomal DNA test and you'll see the MT DNA test if you've taken it. Um, all right, so first we are going to have a look at matches. All right, so here we are on my matches page. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few things on this page. This is a screenshot, so I'm not going to actually click on anything, but I'll just be able to point out things for you. Um, firstly, under filter matches, you'll see where it says regions and it has HVR1, HVR2 and coding regions there. Um, there are actually a few different options there. You can change this if you wanna look at particular regions. Um, just to explain, HVR1 and HVR2 are hypervariable regions one and two. So they're two different segments that are part of the mitochondria and they're of the most interest to us sort of in genetic genealogy or whatever. So, um, Different people may have taken different tests. I think in the past, Family Tree DNA used to offer just doing the HVR1 or, you know, different options. So they cost sort of different amounts. Uh, so some people will have just taken one test or another. Here I've done the full sequence, um, but different. If you change that, you might get some different matches just because you'll see different people. That makes sense, right? <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. All right. 
So on to the next thing. If you look lower down, you'll see the um, matches. And the first thing there is genetic distance. Um, that is only going to show up for people who've done the full sequence test. The lower sequences, um, lower sequences? I don't know. The lower level tests um, don't show the genetic distance. But what actually it is, is telling you how many values that are different between your results. So between me and each of these matches, I have a genetic distance of one. If I scroll down, you'll find people with a genetic distance of two. I think it goes up to three. Um, so here, my genetic distance of one tells me that there is one value different between myself and this match. Um, and that might not sound like a lot, just one value, but actually you're usually looking for people that are exact matches. So they would have a genetic distance of zero. And for most people, you should have a bunch of zeros, which are the perfect matches, um, because mitochondrial DNA is very stable. So you don't tend to get a lot of mutations. I'll explain later why I suspect that I don't actually have any zeros. Um, which is really frustrating for me, but for most of you, it should be fine. So if you click on the person's name, you can actually see a little bit more info about them, such as their haplogroup and their most recent ancestor, if they've put it in there and their email address, if you want to contact them. So that's useful if you want to collaborate. Um, On to the next column. Uh, there's a few little hyperlinks. So the first one is an email hyperlink if you want to email them. The second one is notes. So that is just little notes that you can put in about that match. So maybe if you've emailed them, you might write, you know, I emailed them and this is the response that I got or this is what we figured out or something. Um and then the next bit, that little blue icon that you can see next to some of them, it's, that's a family tree. So if they've uploaded a GEDCOM, that will be a link to view their GEDCOM. So you'll be able to see if there's anyone in their tree that looks familiar to you. And then the FMS or FF, that's telling you what tests that they've taken. So FMS is the full sequence for the mitochondrial DNA and FF is family finder. That's the um, autosomal DNA test. Um, The next column is the earliest known ancestor. So not everyone has bothered to fill this one out, but if they have, it's pretty useful. So this will be tracing up their maternal line um, mother to mother to mother, as far back as they can go, who's their last sort of relative um, on that side. So it's always going to be a female's name. And yeah, if that name looks familiar or sometimes it actually has a place name next to it as well, um, you might be able to see if it matches up with anything in your tree. Because obviously with the maternal line, you're going to constantly have surname changes each generation. So it's really useful if you can um, if you can see somebody with the same surname, you'll be able to match it up exactly. Um, but yeah, that's what that is. Just one more thing is that you might not act- share that actual ancestor. So my one here has this Rose Ann Conroy. Um, so I might not share that ancestor. I might not be descended from her. Because we might actually share an ancestor much, much further back. So we do share a common ancestor. It's just how far back is the question. And then you've got the haplogroup, which is straightforward. That's me, H56C. And then on the last column, the match date. So that might be the date that I uploaded my DNA or it might be the date that they uploaded theirs, but it'll be the date that the match happened. And if you want to, you can actually click on match date and that will instead sort the columns by the match if you just want to look at your most recent, for example. Okay, so now just I'll just point out what you can sort of make of these matches. So if you match on HVR1 just only HVR1, then there's a 50% probability that you shared a common ancestor within 52 generations back. So that's approximately 1,300 to 1,300 to 1,500 years ago. So it might not be that far back. It could be that you shared a common ancestor one generation ago, but that's how stable it is. 
So you may share somebody within any of that period of time. Does that make sense? Why do I keep saying, does that make sense? It makes sense, right? Ask any questions in the comments below if it doesn't make sense. (laughs) All right. So if you match on HBR1 and HBR2, then that increases the probability. So it's still 50% probability, but it's that the ancestor lived within 28 generations. So that's, that's sort of around the 700 to 900 years ago. So we're getting a bit closer to the current generation. It's a little bit more narrow. Last one, the full sequence. If you've done the full sequence and you match on that, then there's a 90% probability that you've shared a common ancestor within the last 16 generations. So that's about four to 500 years ago. But like I said, you might've shared one just like 50 years ago or something. So it just shows the difference between if you've done the HBR1 or HBR1 and HBR2 or the full sort of sequence. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please, if you have any questions or comments, pop them down below. I will respond to them. Um, And stay tuned for the next part of this. I'll hopefully release it within the next sort of day or two, but that will be all about the mutation section, which is, in my opinion, even more interesting. So (laughs) stay tuned for that. Um, Have a good one and happy researching and I love you. Bye.